Hello everyone and welcome back. Now this is the final video in my partial differential equations lecture series. So congratulations, you made it, right? And in this last video, I just want to show you one more partial differential equation, as if you didn't have enough already. But what I'd like to introduce you to is the iconal equation. And I'm going to show you how it's related to the two-dimensional wave equation. And I'm going to show you how it's related to the method of characteristics. Now, the iconal equation, as you're going to see, is a genuinely complicated nonlinear partial differential equation that in general, you know, it, the methods of solving it are far beyond what we've covered in this class. However, I will show just some simple cases uh, where you can solve it using the method of characteristics. And I'm going to leave it to spark some interest in you and maybe spark some creativity as you go beyond this lecture series. So let's start with the two-dimensional wave equation. Now, in this case, I'm going to use E as my unknown variable. Here I've got partial squared, uh, sorry, C squared, partial X squared. So here I have the Laplacian operator. And the first thing that I want you to remember is what a plane wave solution is. So we talked about this way, way back early on when we sort of talked about special solutions to the wave equation. But a, a plane wave solution is going to look like this. So it's going to be a solution to the, to the wave equation that has a profile A and it sort of moves like sines and cosines with a specified frequency. The way you can kind of think about this is, is like a big elastic drum, right? So maybe it's, um, it has a very specific shape. So maybe it's just this sort of conical shape. And then this thing is causing it to oscillate back and forth on some spread out sheet. Now, in my case, C could be a function of space and uh, and even time if I wanted to. And that would sort of dictate what the shape would look like here. But first of all, let's just notice that if I do this, I get my old Hemholtz equation. So I get minus omega squared A is equal to C squared partial squared A partial x squared plus partial squared a partial y squared. So it's Helmholtz, right? As long as c is constant, this is going to be uh, a Helmholtz equation. And we need omega to be constant. So let's do this. It has to be constant. It's my, sort of my eigenfunction here, if you'd like. And we can notice that if c is constant, This can be solved. There are many sort of solutions to this thing. You can use the Fourier transform, for example, to solve this. Uh, but the solution that I'm interested in is going to be some, some constant number, I'll call it A naught, and then E to the power of I K one X plus K two Y. And K one and K two can be any values between uh, over the real numbers, but, such that you have this relationship. So if you plug this in here, you get a relationship between omega and the K1 and K2s, which tells you that omega squared has to be equal to C squared times K1 squared plus K2 squared. Okay? So that means that you can pick any two of these and you have to get the other one to fix. Now the way that I think about this is I pick some oscillation frequency in the x domain. So think about sine or cosine with a, you know, a k1x. Some oscillation frequency in the y direction. Now those two things together tell me how I oscillate in time. That's really how you should think about this, right? So it says depending on how you oscillate in space, this will determine how you oscillate in time. However, if C is not constant, what you could do is you could try, well, we could try looking for something that kind of looks like this, 
which would be maybe some profile r of x, y, and then some maybe oscillations in space and uh, in space according to this exponential here. Now, the way that people have to study a lot of these things is through perturbations. So if they say it's sort of weakly non-constant, right? So it means that, you know, there's a little bit of spatial variation, but it's not really wiggly waggly. It's not very, very complicated, right? It's, it's sort of, it's flat for large spots or it looks flat. It's sort of like the surface of the earth, right? It feels like I'm walking on flat ground, even though when I super zoom out, I know that I'm on the surface of a sphere, right? So, you know, if this thing is, is very close to sort of being constant, right? There's not a whole lot of variation. What you can derive, or what you can do first, is you can define, so I'm gonna do a little hand waving here, okay? You can define these quantities. You can define P to be the derivative of U with respect to X, and Q to be the derivative of U with respect to Y. Now remember, U is my exponential piece here. It tells me how I vary in space. Um, essentially, to leading order, so I'm gonna do this, this sort of approximately implied by, you know, so if you do a perturbation expansion, um, R would be constant at first order. And so really what you're trying to do is solve for U, the oscillations in space. And what you would get is you get omega squared is equal to C squared, P squared plus Q squared. And this right here leads to what's called the iconal equation. So iconal equation. And this just comes from putting it back in the U. So we would do omega squared over C squared. Remember C doesn't have to be constant in our case. This thing is equal to partial U partial X squared plus partial U partial Y squared. Now, be careful, right? That is not a second derivative term. That is a square of the first derivative. That is not a Laplace equation. That is not a Helmholtz equation. That is one ugly partial differential equation. That is a nonlinear partial differential equation, right? Whatever the derivative is, square it. This is brutal. So the question is, can we do anything with it? Well, in general, no, right? It's a very complicated nonlinear partial differential equation. Partial differential equations is one of the most active areas of mathematics at the moment. and has been for like, 300 years in a very, very hard and complicated discipline. So I'm not going to solve this thing. I don't have the, the answers to that. What I would like to try and do, though, is I'd like to try and tie it back to what we've done with characteristics. Remember, this all came from the wave equation. We would like to see if we could solve these things using the method of characteristics. And I'm going to sort of move backwards, okay? Case C is constant, okay? So... If you're keeping tally, when C is constant, I already have solutions, they're easy. So I said, imagine it's sort of weakly non-constant and I derive the iconal equation. This thing should also be weakly non-constant, but let's sort of, let's just imagine it's constant again, sort of back ourselves up. Let's see what we can do with the iconal equation. Can we solve anything? Can we do anything useful? Well. We've got this equation here. P squared plus Q squared is equal to omega squared over C squared. That's a constant. What I could do is I could differentiate this thing with respect to X. So let's say differentiate with respect to X. And essentially this is going to give me uh, P so that all the twos can disappear, right? This thing is constant, so it's gonna give me zero. So then this becomes two P times partial P partial X plus two Q partial Q partial X is equal to zero, right? But also I knew that P and Q are related, they both came from U here, right? So also, I know that partial Q with respect to X 
is the same as partial p with respect to y. If you're familiar with the Cauchy-Riemann equations, this should be familiar with you. Uh, and it just comes from these second partials, right? So I get a partial with respect to x down here, then you can just exchange the order of these partial derivatives. But what this gives me is it gives me that p, partial p, partial x, plus q, partial uh, p, partial y is equal to zero. Similarly, I could have differentiated with respect to y, I could get basically the same thing. So I could say differentiate with respect to y. And in this case, so if I use the sort of same trick that I have right here with the opposite partial derivatives, I would get p times partial q partial uh, x plus q partial q partial y is equal to zero. So I have two partial, uh, uh, two partial differential equations. I can actually solve these things with the method of characteristics though. All right, so if I wanted to, I could just divide P off here or I could divide Q off and I would get this in this sort of form. Now it's two space variables. It's not space and time, but it doesn't matter, right? And you can just relabel things. And so the method of characteristics, method of chars, characteristics, essentially what this would give me is that say dp dx is equal to zero, right? From this part right here along the characteristics and moving y as a function of x gives me q over p. Now I'm going to introduce a sort of little accounting equation uh, that you should not sort of take literally, but um, it's a, it's a nice way of sort of working with characteristics, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually sort of rearrange a lot of these things. I'm gonna say uh, dx over p, right? So dx over p is equal to dy over q, okay? So just sort of rearranging this as a fraction. And rearranging this as a fraction is actually gonna give me, uh, let's say, dp over zero. Okay, it's, I know that it looks horrible, but it's just a good way for me to um, do some accounting and to tell me that my solution is constant along characteristics, right? The, de the derivative of P has to be zero for this to make any sense as, a, as an equation, right? So similarly, if you did the same thing with the Q equation, you would get DQ over zero as well, and you would still get this equation uh, right here. So that tells me that the, the, the functions p and q are constant along these things and that they are, the characteristics are straight lines, right? From this right here because p and q are constant. Now, okay, so let's write that. Here are straight lines. So the question is, what does this mean for the original function u? So how does u vary along these characteristic curves? Well, let's take a total derivative of u. So I'm gonna say du, which is partial derivative of u with respect to x times the change in x, plus the partial derivative of u with respect to y times the change in y. Now, first of all, this is p and then times dx plus q times dx. If you're coming from more of a physics background, this is probably the kind of notation uh, that, that you know, maybe feels right to you. This is the kind of stuff that you would see in a physics class a lot, especially if you come from like Hamiltonian, Lagrangian mechanics. Nonetheless, let's multiply and divide by p here. So I get p squared dx over p and same thing with q, q squared, uh, sorry, this is y, pardon me, dy over q, which 
dy over q is the same as dx over p, so these are the same terms. So I get p squared plus q squared dx over p. And remember, p squared plus q squared is equal to omega squared over c squared. So I get omega squared over c squared dx over p. Okay, so now the question is, is this helping us? Well, if we add to our sort of chain of equalities here, let's see what we've come up with. We've got sort of du over omega squared over c squared is equal to dx over p, right? Which is equal to dy over q, which is equal to a constant. Right? Because we said that the characteristics are constant, right? This tells us that P is uh, not changing on the characteristics. Q is not changing on the characteristics. That Then when we put it into this, it tells us the characteristics are straight lines in X and Y. And so therefore, this also tells us that um, the characteristics are straight lines as well on U. So this implies that the Cars are straight lines. Lines in U as well, coming from the iconal equation. Now, okay, it looks like I did a whole lot of work. I actually didn't, right? And in part, this comes from the fact that, you know, th these are just solutions to the wave equation whenever C is constant, right? And we've already studied the wave equation. We only did it in 1D, but we talked about characteristics. In our case, uh, we've just sort of extended the method of characteristics to 2D as well. But it's the same basic concept here that uh, essentially tells us that um, U is, is going to be uh, constant along these, th uh, along these characteristic models, or along these characteristic curves that are given by these dx over P and dy over Q. But the real point of this is to show you that, first of all, we've got a new partial differential equation, nonlinear, iconal equation. There are some cases where you can solve it, and you can solve it with the method of characteristics. So a new application of an old idea. And we got a whole new partial differential equation from an old one, right? And this comes up a lot, right? When you're trying to solve partial differential equations, something that might even look easy, you know, just the wave equation. We, we should probably be, be pretty comfortable with the wave equation by now. But even something as simple as the wave equation leads us to a very complicated iconal equation. And that's because, you know, this thing is in two space dimensions. We're looking for solutions that are slightly more complicated than one would achieve by just doing maybe separation of variables or something like that, or by introducing an inhomogeneity into the system. But the point is, that you can derive new partial differential equations from old ones just from trying to solve them, right? So you have this sort of fractal quality of I tried to solve this one, I got a new partial differential equation. Then I tried to solve that one, I got a new partial differential equation. And you know, it sort of becomes turtles all the way down. Now, by the end of this lecture series, you're probably not an expert on partial differential equations. I am not even an expert on partial differential equations, if I can be modest. Um, but you probably have a pretty good understanding of A, how to read them, B, to tell whether they're linear or not, C, to see if you can use separation of variables on them, and D, you have a variety of methods to solve a variety of partial differential equations. That is much more than you probably started with, and it is a good base to go forward into much more complicated topics of PDEs. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I've had a lot of fun talking about this with you, uh, and I hope that you'll join me on the next lecture series that I do on this channel. Thank you.